Today's lecture will sit at the intersection of my interest in natural resources and international security issues, specifically the fisheries of the Lake Victoria Basin. Now, I'm not a fisheries scientist. If you catch me on a fishing vessel, I'll probably look a lot like this, seasick and useless for sampling and gut content analysis. You may reasonably ask why a professor at a landlocked institution with no obvious role on a boat is so interested in fisheries. In brief, the reasons are several. First, fisheries form the primary source of protein for more than 1 billion mostly poor people worldwide. One can scarcely care about food security among the poor without caring about fish. Second, fisheries are the last large-scale wild source of food and economic activity. And given that many fisheries are migratory in nature, they engender concerns about maritime territory and space that have been a persistent source of friction, if not manifest conflict, at multiple scales, historically. Addressing declines in global fisheries will entail solutions to massive collective action problems perhaps only surpassed by the specter of global climate change. In what has been called Africa's smallest war, it's not really a war, but hyperbole has never been not helpful in generating clicks, both Kenya and Uganda lay claim to Magingo Island, a tiny island in the waters of Lake Victoria that is covered by tin roof dwellings and straddles the Ugandan-Kenyan lacustrine, i.e. lake-based, border. While the claims over the island, the conflict is about something else entirely. Lattes niloticus, also known as Nile perch, a tasty white fish that swims in the waters surrounding the island. Most of the ones being caught now are significantly smaller than the one you see here. Nile perch were introduced to Lake Victoria in the 1950s, which resulted in a fisheries boom, but nearly drove to extinction the native cichlid populations that have made Lake Victoria so central to our modern understanding of evolution and speciation. The fish forms the backbone of the Lake Victoria economy, but it's increasingly hard to come by along the lakeshore. Catches are in decline, incomes are dropping, and the Ugandan government in particular is taking increasingly harsh, militarized steps to attempt to revive the fishery. These steps include the ceding of fisheries management and policing to the Ugandan People's Defense Forces, which is the army, uh, and they are taking very harsh actions like large-scale confiscation and destruction of both fishing boats and illegal gears, like nets with too fine a mesh. Estimates by Dr. Tabu Anthony Munyao, director of the National Fisheries Resources Research Institute, or NAFIRI, suggest up to 40% of all boats in Ugandan waters have been destroyed. The crackdown escalated in early 2018 with no warning to even the fishing communities affected, and there have been reports of brutal beatings and even killings surfacing. Who's to blame for this decline in the fishery? Fisheries are complex systems, so numerous factors like human population growth, climate change, and changing lake chemistry come into play. But there's another, perhaps more surprising culprit, Joseph Kony, the still-at-large leader of the Lord's Resistance Army, and as a result of Kony 2012, the poster warlord of the 21st century. Now, you can blame Joseph Kony for many bad things. That this also lands at his feet explains a lot about the mysterious ways in which coupled natural and human systems work, and why we need to think about conflict dynamics when thinking about fisheries management. Fisheries and armed conflict in the Lake Victoria Basin form a coupled natural human system, in which armed conflict has led to population displacement and migration, fueling an intensification of fishing pressure in the lake, resulting in changes in the abundance of Nile perch and Nile perch catch. These changes, I further argue, have fed back into armed conflict dynamics, creating tensions between Kenya and Uganda over Magingo Island. This coupled natural human system exists in the Lake Victoria Basin. The basin includes parts of Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, which all border the lake, as well as Rwanda and Burundi, and a small part of the eastern Congo. Lake Victoria is part of the other Great Lakes region, and is the world's second largest lake by surface area, but only ninth by volume, owing to its being exceptionally shallow. The lake is part of the headwaters of the Nile, and is or was home to an incredibly diverse array of cichlids, like the ones you see here. These fish are found at Petco's and PetSmart's across America as ornamental fish, but have played an incredibly important role in evolutionary biologists' understanding of speciation in aquatic environments. They've been called the Darwin's finches of the water. Now, the Lake Victoria Basin is one of the fastest-growing regions on Earth, with annualized population growth over 3.3% for the last two decades. If there were a country called Victoria, it would be among the 10 fastest-growing countries on Earth. Population growth within 5 kilometers of the lakeshore has been even more rapid. Using Afropop data at 1 kilometer grid resolution, we were able to calculate an 8.7% annualized growth rate between 2000 and 2010. That implies massive in-migration. To be blunt, the region is poor, with food insecurity relatively widespread, and ranging from 19% in Kenya to over 50% in Burundi. 
Dependence on rural livelihoods is high, and population density in arable regions of the basin is high as well, one of the reasons land-based conflicts have been prevalent there, and which we'll discuss at more length in later lectures. Over the past 30 years, the Lake Victoria Basin has also been one of the most deeply conflict-affected regions on Earth. These UCDP event data, scaled to the number of deaths associated with individual battles or one-sided killings, show just how prevalent that violence has been. Our story today will focus mostly on the dynamics in Uganda, where armed conflict in the north drove widespread population displacement to the relatively peaceful south. If we have time in class, we can discuss how this pattern occurred as well as a result of conflicts in Rwanda and Burundi, which resulted in widespread population displacement into Tanzania and may have had similar effects for the fishery there. Lake Victoria's fisheries form the backbone of the local economy. Across the three countries, we estimate that there are roughly 220,000 fishers working on the lake. Based on estimates by Rashid Sumaila and colleagues, by which one fisher supports four more secondary jobs in processing or marketing, like the woman you see here selling daga, which is a small silverfish, that means the total contribution to employment in the Lake Victoria Basin is in the neighborhood of 1.1 million jobs, which is roughly one-third of the working age population in the immediate vicinity of the lake. It's very important. The fishery is artisanal, with the modal boat, i.e. the most common boat, looking a lot like the one you see below. Few are longer than 15 meters, and most are powered by paddles or sails. In contrast to developed country fisheries, which are dominated by industrial fleets, the sector is relatively lightly capitalized, implying comparatively lower barriers to entry. It is also open access. While there are nominal fees that must be paid for landing fish, there are no catch restrictions or formal access barriers. More recently, these capture fisheries are experiencing competition in the form of lake-based cage aquaculture, pens where tilapia are grown and harvested. This brings us to our CNH diagram, in which the human system and interplays between conflict, livelihood strategies, and food security outcomes jointly produce fishing effort, i.e. the number of individuals fishing the lake and the amount of effort they expend. For any given level of effort, the interactions of the aquatic subsystem, rendered here in terms of food web dynamics, the interactions of fish and various types of plankton, will determine the relative abundances of the fished species, and therefore the amount of fish landed or caught. The landings, in turn, affect local livelihoods and food security, which can either be affected by or affect conflict dynamics. Now we turn to the effects of armed conflict generally, and dynamics in the Lake Victoria Basin specifically. The primary way conflict affects fishing effort appears to be displacement and labor redeployment, i.e. people moving away from the fishing areas or going into different types of work. Previous studies have found differing effects of civil conflict on fisheries. My study with Sarah Glasser in 2011 found civil conflicts associated with civil wars, i.e. large armed conflicts, depressed catch by over 16% relative to pre-war levels. The main factor explaining the direction of the outcome is proximity of actual fighting to fishing grounds. In some instances, like the conflict between the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, a separatist group seeking autonomy for the Tamil people and the Sri Lankan government, the fighting was highly concentrated in northern and northeastern coastal cities, particularly along the Jaffna Peninsula, where fishing was very prevalent. This map of battle depths, produced by the Uppsala Conflict Data Project, clearly illustrates this. In this conflict, destruction of fishing boats was part of a counterinsurgency tactic, and many fishers either left or were recruited into, i.e. redeployed in, the insurgency itself, which is one of the reasons the LTTE, or the Liberation Tigers, were one of the only insurgent groups ever to have a more or less conventional naval force, called the Sea Tigers. Fighting was close to fishing grounds, resulting in fisheries disruption and decreased catch. In Uganda, however, the story, at least over the last two decades, was quite different. After reasonably widespread fighting in the 1980s and 1990s, conflict between the Lord's Resistance Army and the Ugandan government was highly concentrated in the northern part of the country, centered on the Gulu, Kitgum, and Potter districts. The LRA was formed in the late 1980s by Joseph Kony from the remnants of a deposed Acholi-dominated armed forces, which had been ousted by current President Yari Museveni's National Revolutionary Army, and fighters from a organization called the Holy Spirit Movement, an Acholi-led and dominated armed group led by Alice Auma, a woman who claimed to be possessed by a Christian spirit. 
The LRA had limited success as an armed group until the early 1990s, when the group picked up the backing of the Sudanese government in Khartoum, essentially as retribution for Museveni supporting John Garang's Sudanese People's Liberation Army, the South Sudanese force that had been fighting to gain independence for South Sudan from Khartoum. Sorry, that got a little complicated. With bases in South Sudan and freed from reliance on the local Acholi populations for material support, the LRA became increasingly violent towards local civilian populations, who Kony believed had turned against him. The LRA eventually became famous, and by famous I mean actually famous, like household name in the United States famous, for their large-scale abductions of children to serve as either child soldiers, porters, or the wives of rebels. This practice was highlighted in 2006 by the documentary Invisible Children, which would later spawn the Kony 2012 movement. This conflict began a process of large-scale population displacement toward Uganda's comparatively peaceful south, which was spared the direct effects of fighting. As fighting between the LRA and the Ugandan government and child abductions intensified in 2002 and 2003, a point during which estimates suggest 80% of LRA soldiers were abducted children, the conflict began generating mass numbers of internally displaced persons who were unable to flee across the border to either Democratic Republic of Congo or Sudan because of ongoing armed conflicts there. The internally displaced population grew even more as fighting intensified and the Ugandan government rolled out a variant of the old protected hamlet plan from the Vietnam War, attempting to seal off the civilian population in semi-hardened and secure positions. Between 2002 and 2006, the peak year of the conflict, The number of IDPs in Uganda increased from 550,000 to almost 2 million, with IDPs closely following battle deaths, a somewhat noisy indicator of conflict intensity. So, more intense conflict, more population displacement. It's important to note, too, that these numbers probably radically underestimate the true volume of population displacement. Official IDP statistics only count those who were relocated to protected villages and or received emergency assistance. This accounting does not capture those living with host families or friends or relatives in urban settings, in transit between locations, and those whose internal migration may have been motivated in part by conflict or coercion, but that itself is not recognized as displacement. Many people who move from northern Uganda to southern Uganda would not self-identify as migrants or refugees. An estimate published in 2005, when roughly 1.8 million persons were in official IDP camps, suggested that there were anywhere from 300,000 to 600,000 additional self-settled IDPs in the towns of Gulu, Lira, and Kampala, Uganda's largest city, alone. Moreover, these invisible IDPs were overwhelmingly composed of working-age men. According to estimates by the UN High Commissioner on Refugees, 80% of the official IDP camp dwellers were women or children, and the men in camps were often elderly. This population displacement had dramatic effects for food production and the local economy. Prior to the intensification of the conflict, the northern Acholiland region had accounted for 20% of Uganda's arable land and had been a net surplus source of food and cash crops, like cotton, as well as livestock production. By 2006, 85% of the residents of Gulu District were food insecure, and agricultural production and associated livelihoods had plummeted. In this context, southern urban areas in the lakeshore and the open-access fishery there became an increasingly attractive destination for those seeking alternative livelihoods. So, given these dynamics, what would be evidence that these dynamics actually formed a coupled natural human system? First, fish catch would respond to internal displacement as the number of internally displaced persons or refugees who stay within the border of their country of origin increased, so would fish catch. More people fishing usually means more fish being caught. Second, migrants would be more prevalent in Ugandan fisheries than in Kenyan and Tanzanian fisheries. All three groups would face the same economic incentives, but only one of them, i.e. the Ugandans, would be pushed from their homes by conflict. Third, fishing pressure during the conflict affected period would increase faster in Uganda than in either Kenya or Tanzania, for the same reasons. Fourth, we would see a longish-run decrease in fish catch and catch per fisher in the aftermath of the spike. This would be consistent with the threshold effects we discussed in our last lecture. And finally, an increase in conflict over the remaining fisheries resources, potentially at different spatial scales. Now regarding the first point, the correlation is certainly evident. Uganda Nile perch catch is correlated with the number of IDPs at 0.76 and at 0.89 with a one-year lag. That's a very tight correlation. 
there's certainly some first blush evidence that the two phenomena are interrelated. Catch follows population displacement. Second, migrants are much more prevalent in the Ugandan fishery than the Kenyan or Tanzanian. Our evidence comes from a survey of 1,305 self-identified participants in the Lake Victoria fishery conducted in 2016. Whereas the Kenyan and Tanzanian fisheries are are composed of over 70% locals, i.e. those who self-identify as being from lake communities, in Uganda, migrants predominate, accounting for 55% of participants. The survey was not actually about conflict dynamics, but rather about livelihood strategies and perceived challenges and opportunities in the fishery, so they weren't being asked to reflect on conflict dynamics when they were self-identifying. Also, we demonstrate that the rate of increase in fishing pressure during the peak years of the Ugandan conflict was much larger, 36%, than in Kenya and Tanzania over the same time, though all three fisheries experienced similar market incentives in the form of price and demand from export markets. Whereas the number of fishers along the Kenyan and Tanzanian coast increased by 10 per kilometer, in Uganda it increased by 13.6, so 36% more. Furthermore, we can see evidence for a possible conflict threshold effect from changes in Nile perch catch relative to abundance, which we measured bioacoustically, i.e. using ultra-fancy versions of the fish finders your aunt or uncle might have on their bass boat. Biomass and catch plotted here for the entire lake. From 2007, the year after the peak of IDPs, to 2008, catch changed from 17 to 40 percent of fish abundance. This change likely resulted in higher levels of fishing effort, i.e. hours spent fishing, to maintain a stable catch. We theorized this increased pressure could have led to simmering conflict in Magingo, which is associated with Nile perch access, to boil over in 2009. Similarly, after a large increase in fishing effort and catch in Uganda in 2007, the year after peak population displacement due to the armed conflict, catches across the lake have gone into relative decline, both in the absolute sense and in the per-fisher sense, which with concomitant effects for local livelihood and food security. People are having to work much harder to catch fewer fish. Now, since 2012, Ugandan catch has trended towards its pre-conflict level but the fisheries as a whole has gone into a seemingly linear decline, largely at the expense of Kenyan catch. This precipitous decline in the Nile perch fishery brings us back to Magingo, an island that, due to its remoteness, was spared some of the fishing out of coastal fishing grounds and which became the object of a militarized interstate dispute around 2007 and peaked in 2009, the year after the Lake Victoria Nile perch fishery went into decline. Note here that scarcity in in the fishery fed back into the conflict system, but not in the same place or to the same spatial extent. It did not feed back into the conflict between Joseph Kony and the Ugandan government in the north. Rather, it fed back into conflict between the governments of Kenya and Uganda over the lake territory. For most of the 20th century, Magingo was uninhabited and nominally administered by Kenyan authorities in accordance with border demarcations conducted by the colonial British authority in 1926. The island remained unpopulated until 1991, when two Kenyan fishers occupied it, describing it as weed and snake infested. Given that those snakes may have been black cobras, it's a testament to their work ethic and desperation that they decided to stay on the island at all. In 2004, it was found abandoned by two Ugandan fishermen, who found only one structure on the entire island. Things started heating up in 2007, with the arrest of 16 Kenyan fishers by Ugandan police in September. Continuing through 2008, reports of harassment of Kenyan fishers by Ugandan authorities were prevalent. However, these conflicts became more acute in 2009, a time corresponding to greater fishing pressure and decreasing catches in Kenya and Uganda. In January of 2009, the Kenyan Prime Minister called for the harassment to cease, and the next month, the island dispute appeared on the agenda at the East African Legislative Assembly meeting in Rwanda. In February... Twelve Kenyan police officers were arrested by Ugandan military soldiers and held for five days. Ugandan officials have denied this report. The East African community minister called the deployment of troops on the island an insult to the EAC treaty. On February 24th of that year, Kenyan Prime Minister Raila Odinga laid claim to Magingo. Ugandan officials responded by hoisting two Ugandan flags and requiring all Kenyans to sign a visitor book upon island entry, arresting Kenyan fishermen for allegedly crossing into Ugandan waters, and in stating a residence application and fee for Kenyans remaining on the island. The dispute continued into late 2009, with tensions flowing to the point that Rwandan President and EAC Chairman Paul Kagame offered to mediate between the two parties. In May, the Kenyan Parliament passed a motion urging President Mwai Kibaki to seek intervention by the UN Security Council. 
For a conflict over an island that had been uninhabited only five years earlier, that's a pretty significant and rapid escalation. Other scholars, in particular African scholars like Wafulo Okumu and Peter Wakesa, have acknowledged the role of fisheries in the escalation of the Magingo conflict, as have representatives of both governments, albeit at different levels of government. In 2009, then-Ugandan Fisheries Commissioner Wilson Wanja stated, The Magingo conflict has always been there, but was masked by abundant fish stocks. Now that they are declining, the conflicts are more glaring. That same year, Kenyan Prime Minister Raila Odinga remarked, The fight over Magingo Island is not about land, but about fish. The dispute has yet to be resolved, though tensions have waned since their peak in 2009. So, what have we learned from this exercise? Well, I think the main insights are probably three. First, the feedbacks between conflict and fisheries in the Lake Victoria Basin are location-specific, operate through various mechanisms, and feedback to conflict at different spatial scales and actor scales i.e. from subnational conflict to interstate dispute. Second, the open access nature of the fishery likely exacerbates feedbacks that would not be present in a closed access or more managed kind of fishery or system. Indeed, the silver lining of the situation is that it may provide a basis for long-term sustainability of the fishery if fishing can be curtailed long enough for stocks to rebound. And finally, These insights may generalize to other cases where armed conflict is present in artisanal, low-barrier-to-entry fisheries are a critical source of livelihood and food security. The critical factor determining whether or not these dynamics will be present being the proximity of fighting to fishing areas. So, in this lecture, we've discussed a coupled natural human system that, as you know from the reading, is very near and dear to my heart. I look forward to discussing this case and others with you in class.